Good evening and welcome to Milkshake Monday, episode 119, Reconciliation, the Impact of Silence. Well, before I start with the word reconciliation, I want to just make sure you understand that word before we go further. When something is together, there's a time that it be pulled apart, there's a breach. And in order for it to come back together, we're going to say it's going to be reconciled, it's going to be brought back together. Well, in some of our relationships, we have situations where there's been a breach. There's been something that has split apart a relationship that was together and is now no longer. Now, over the last few weeks, uh, several people have talked to me, relatives, friends, people I really don't know. And a couple of situations have raised their heads that have caused me concern. And so I was planning to teach something about silence and the way that it was going to go was totally different than what this turned out that the Holy Spirit led me to go forward. And as I was talking to Reverend Helm, he even asked a question of me and said, did you think about this? And as I thought about it, I said, oh, that's got to be in the teaching tonight. But I want you to understand that we often say silence speaks volumes, but I want to help you understand that the the silence and the volumes that it speaks sometimes could be pain, that people's silence could just speak volumes of pain, volumes of anger, volumes of disappointment, volumes of restraint for what they really want to say, but they just don't. Volumes of all of the things in their heart that the brokenness can't express because if this expresses a little bit of it, the rest of it will pour out and they just can't handle the overflow of all those things that they pack down into their heart year after year. So I also say that silence speaks about your past, your present, and even about your future. So tonight, as we listen to the word of God about things about reconciliation and anger and forgiveness. Because I put in the advertisement for this that estrangement, being apart, separating yourself from somebody that you once had a relationship with, and unforgiveness are destructive twins. And in the Christian community, people that say, oh, I love God, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus Christ, we have a disease that's festering in the household of God in these people that we are finding ourselves with such estrangement, unforgiveness, and the lack of reconciliation that it's starting to bubble up beyond a rumor, beyond, oh, I'm slow to anger and great in mercy. Often, we try to emulate this passage in Psalm 145, verse 8. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. Now, if you had seen in the beginning of the scripture of Psalm 145, it talks about us finding God is great and greatly to be praised, and that we're going to meditate on the glorious splendor of his majesty and your wondrous works. One of the wondrous works that I think that many of us don't have the capacity, or I won't say they don't, that we don't have the capacity. We miss the opportunity for the fact that God is slow to anger. Doesn't mean he doesn't get angry. It means that he's slow to anger. But the thing about him, it says he's gracious and full of compassion. And when we start to find that there's a festering of a lack of reconciliation, it's because we do the opposite. We're not gracious. We're not compassionate and we're quick to have a bad temper. We're quick to be angry. We're quick to have offense. We're quick to be upset, offended by things that happen to us. Well, I wanted you to see that Christ and the Lord God are not. You have to understand that's exactly why he came. Even at the beginning of Genesis, when we had failed and sinned against his very commands, he immediately was gracious and full of compassion to allow his son in that divine plan to come and to save us. But a lot of people say, oh, I don't believe that God was ever angry. God, when he took the form of human flesh without sin, has those same emotions flowing in his mortal body at the time. He had divinity and he had 
the human body. So I want you to see, let's go to Mark chapter 3, verse 2. Mark chapter 3, verse 2 is a situation where originally when I was going to start this teaching, I was going to talk about the silence that we find in the church, that people will come to church and they'll flop in their seat and they will not say save life or to kill, but they kept silent. They kept silent like some people, even in our churches and our houses of worship. We will see something that is right, but because we don't like the person or we don't like what they're doing because it wasn't our idea, we keep silent. We don't support it. But in this case, these people that were ready to accuse and really didn't like Jesus even being on the scene, they kept silent. Verse 5 says, and when he looked around at them, now people, he reacted in righteous indignation about Pharisees and Sadducees not wanting to have a man healed with their, with his hand being healed. But in the case of your family members, your spouses, your children, your best buddies, your friends, the people you haven't talked to in a while, they may accuse you of things, but you're not reacting the same way that Jesus Christ reacted. You're not reacting in righteousness. You nothing. So here it says he, Jesus was being accused by the chief priest, but he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they're testifying against you? But he answered him not one word. So the governor marveled greatly. Now, some of you have had some nasty people say some things about you that you know are not true. Under speaking to each other, some of you married couples, you come and y'all sitting in one side of the pew and the other one's at the other side of the pew. Some of y'all sitting together making sure there's enough distance because you really can't stand one another. You're ticked off about what happened yesterday or last week or over 10 years ago. A lot of things are happening in these marital relationships, but in reality, in the church, a lot of people need to be reconciled back to the marital relationship. They need to even evangelize to people. So let's go to Ephesians chapter four, verse 26. It says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Couples, you're getting on one another's nerves. You're saying things that you shouldn't say. You're speaking ugliness to one another. You're cutting each other deep. And then you're going to bed and that stuff is festering. And instead of it, and because of your split, somebody says a corrupt word. Somebody says something that offends you. Somebody says something that is hurtful and harmful to you and you can't see past it. You're fuming and you're going to bed and it's, it's getting worse every time you think about it. Every time you remember it, you're remembering what they're saying and what they said about you and what you believe was not true the anger and the disappointment and the estrangement becomes. You can't do the very thing that Christ did for you and I, which is forgive us. We were supposed to be estranged and in hell, in the pit of hell, based on all the things that we did against God. But thanks be to God of his graciousness, his compassion, that he was slow to anger. And then he said, I'm going to go father. And the father is to hell sure about that? Let's go to Matthew chapter, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 5. Are you sure that God wants us to be reconciled? Is that something that I'm just bringing up, I'm just throwing it up in the air? Not really. Matthew chapter 5 verse 23 and 24 says, therefore, this is us, this is the Lord talking to us, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, that makes you, it says, leave your gift at the altar. Leave it there before the altar and go your way. What way is he talking about? Go your way first. Be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. God says, I don't need to have your offering before you realize that you need to get yourself and compassionate he's slow to anger and he's full of forgiveness but we have this problem with our people and we don't want to be reconciled we want to hold on to the unforgiveness and we wonder why the people can't see Christ in us because we're full of the lie of lack of forgiveness 
and we don't want to be reconciled for those that are in our life. And that's not right. That is not of God. That's why he said, said two years ago, and it took me a minute to understand when I told them they had to go to the person that they had this estrangement and about forgiveness and take the first step. And the person never called them back. The second story is a situation where there's been some offense one way or the other way. And now the parties aren't talking and there's hurt, there's disappointment, there's anger, all those feelings that you have when you feel like you've been wrong, disrespected, dishonored, whatever the word you want to say. Another situation, a brother and sister, whenever you feel like it, we can talk, but not until I feel like it. We cannot use silence as a weapon. That's not the way it's supposed to be. That's why God said, don't go to bed angry. Get that thing right. Ask for forgiveness because Christ has forgiven you. So back to the story of Esau and his brother. I'm going to summarize it because time is drawing nigh. You have a brother, two brothers, Esau from the field, to make him think that it's your brother Esau so he can give you the blessing and not your brother. Long story short, the daddy gets to meet. He tests the brother and says, is this Esau, my son? And Jacob lies. Jacob schemes his brother after the birthright. He schemes his brother after the blessing. And he lies to his daddy. Knowing he's Jacob. Mama's in on it. So when the time comes, when Esau comes, Esau comes back. But then I'm going to kill Jacob. And some of y'all just waiting for mama and daddy to leave because you really can't stand your brethren. You can't stand these people in your life, but you don't want mama to be upset. You don't want the daddy to be upset. So that's what Esau said. He's going to wait till the day of morning when my daddy dies and then I'm going to kill him because he deserves it. He has swindled me out of my blessing and my birthright. recognizes that he's in fear of the hatred that he left his brother. He left his brother in a hateful position where the brother wanted to kill him. And now God has told him, you got to read the scripture. God has told him, you got to go back and I'm going to be with you. But all the time he's thinking, uh, Esau want to kick my, he didn't want to kick me, he want to kill me. And now I got all these kids and this stuff. And then he gets the word that Esau's coming. We went and told him you're coming, but Esau's coming. He's bringing 400. Remember that Christ forgave all of us of our sins. And these brothers have been apart. They had the same daddy. They were twins. They were in the same womb together. They grew up together and this schism happened. And yes, Jacob was wrong to do that against Esau and Esau was wrong to want to kill him for it. But the reality is something had transpired where God says, you got to go back home to your kin, but I'm going to be with you. But 